I hope he is here. Ah, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this session is, is on the biofield part. So we will we'll specifically look at the, mm -hmm. how the biofuels are modeled in Capri. Um, and the structure of the presentation is similar to what we had yesterday. So there will be a kind of general presentation in the beginning. And then we do an exercise. Um, at the end of the exercise, there are, you know, I have some questions that you can fill in yourself, um, but we can also do it together so that I show how to look more efficiently for the results with the user interface. Okay, um, let me first um, share my screen. It's always the most difficult part. Um, Okay, can you see the presentation now? Yes. Just a short few. Okay, thanks. Um, so let's let's talk about the background a little bit, yeah? So why biofuels are important and interesting for us to check. Um, basically, the, the current biofuel module that Capri includes was developed quite, quite so many years ago. Um, you can see it on the right hand side, that's the, that's the original source of the report, which describes the biofuel market model, market module. So if you want to have a closer look on this, then I suggest to start here. Of course, we are constantly improving the documentation on the website. So most of the content of this report is already available online. Um, okay, so biofuels, um, were highly promoted like uh, a decade ago as renewable alternative to fossil fuels. Um, but over time, more and more issues with sustainability and the... Uh, do you have also the same problems, Mihaly? I mean... Yes, I, I have some problems too here, Mihaly. Okay. Let's wait, maybe he comes back. Now, now you're back. Okay, so can you hear me? Yeah, 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 we can hear you. Okay, I hope not much was lost from the presentation. So I was talking about the indirect land use change, which is, which is linked, of course, to biofuel pr production and you know, more closely the first generation of production when we are using crops, uh, food crops or crops that are usually used for feeding the animals for biofuel production. So there is a inherent competition between using the land for food production or for biofuel production. And this is the indirect land use change that, that I refer here. Of course, um, an increased demand for biofuels will increase the, uh, the demand for land, agricultural land, which can have uh, negative consequences on sustainability. Yeah. Um, also, there is a uh, high impact on biodiversity uh, with the first generation type of biofuel production, because um, probably the best example is the United States, uh, where, where they use mostly maize as the raw material for ethanol production. And that's a typical monoculture production system, which is quite bad for, for biodiversity. Um, regarding the, the EU policy background, so we have uh, the Renewable Energy Directive, which sets uh, targets for, for producing energy from renewable sources. And this is where the biofuel production is also, also covered. Um, but of course, um, in a wider policy context, um, the use of biofuels uh, is less, uh, less promoted or less supported by policies over the years. And then you can see that, for example, the, those biofuels that has a high risk of, of the indirect land use change, they should be phased out in the near future. Yeah, some of the 
controversies that biofuel production uh, brought up in the last few years. Um, probably the most in interesting example is the kind of ethanol tourism between Brazil and USA. So due to the um, uh, quite strange US legislation of, of the biofuel mandates, um, there was a time when actually sugarcane based, uh, sugar based ethanol from Brazil was shipped to the US. In return, the corn based ethanol in the US, uh, which received less support in the US, was shipped to, shipped to Brazil. So this kind of um, very, very strange policy um, generated ethanol shuffle could be observed. Of course, it has a very negative impacts on the on the on the climate. Yeah, so we have to ship huge quantities of ethanol on you know in a very long distance. So again, the question is the sustainability of energy production or not. Biofuels were also identified by some authors like. 10, 15 years ago as, as, a, as a contributors for, for worsening food security. This again comes back to the land use changes issue. So if we use the land for producing biofuels, then um, less, less agriculture area is, is available for food production that can also drive up the prices. And um, so some researchers think that biofuel production contributed to the to the food price peaks that could be observed like, like 15 years ago. Yeah. Let's come to country now. So I will first uh, just go through the uh, basic structure of the ethanol market as represented in Capri. So basically you can see at the all the different um, raw materials or biofuel feedstock that can be used for ethanol production. Uh, you have here, here all the all the cereals like wheat, barley, rye, and so on. Um, but there is also ethanol production from sugar, and we have uh, ethanol production also from wine, yeah, which is covered by co covered by the model. Um, an important point is that you can see here um, byproducts that are produced in this process. So we have, for example, DDGS, which is a Feed stuff that is a byproduct of ethanol production, but of course it can be used for for feeding the feeding the animal herd. Um, if we go to the more to the top of the of this chart, you can see that the total ethanol demand is composed of what we produce domestically, but we also cover the internal in the model. So we we have the bilateral trade of ethanol between the countries. Um, quite the same way as we have seen the shuffle between Brazil and the US. And uh, for the domestically produced part, we cover the, the first generation ethanol production. So this is what is actually linked to the agriculture activities in country. So this is linked to the crops, if I, if I can simplify like this. But we also cover the second generation production and something what, what we call non-agriculture industrial production, but that's in the case of ethanol, this is kind of uh, the indus industrial alcohol. So this will not go to the transport sector. So this is something not used for transportation purposes. Yeah? Um, what is important to say here that we do not have um, um, a description of the second generation ethanol production. So this is considered as completely external to the model. So it's something exogenous, if I can say that is. Um, this is based on external projections from other models. Typically, we, we take it from energy models that are much better than, than agricultural models to predict how the second generation of, of biofuel production will look like uh, in the future. Um, one of the main sources of copy is, is the Prime's energy model. Um, and many of the second generation projections come from there, but we also take uh, second generation projections from from the AgLink model, which is um, one of the um, main output models, the projection models used by the European Commission. So Excuse me, just, just a quick question. Yes. Uh, the, the second generation ethanol production is simply a term for saying future technologies of ethanol production, yeah? Yes, exactly. If you think about it in the copy context, this is everything what is not linked to the 
crop activities, cropping activities that we have in the mall. All right, thank you. So let's go to the, yeah, <laughs> let's go to the biodiesel market. So again, the, the basic structure is very similar, but of course we have different feedstocks. Um, what is probably important to note here is that uh, in Capri, the production of biodiesel is linked to the oils. So we have seen also yesterday in, in the example of we have in the model soybeans, so we have, we have the beans, the seed, um, but we also have the processed meal and the processed oil. Yeah. And um, what we have in, in the coffee biofilm module is that the biodiesel production is linked to the oil. So you have linked to the rapeseed oil, sunflower oil, soya oil, but also to the palm oil, uh, which is not produced in the EU, but is imported. Uh, so for example, we will see in the exercise later on that if, um, if we increase the mandates for biodiesel production, then it can generate an import of palm oil from other countries. And of course, it has all the, all the sustainability questions uh, and deforestation questions attached to it. But we will cover it a bit later. Um, so again, regarding the demand structure, we have again domestically produced biodiesel in the model. And again, we have the breakdown of, of non-agriculture, second generation, and first generation. And then we have the imported biodiesel. So this is what builds up the demand for, for biodiesel in the model. Okay, so let's, I would like to first cover the demand side, then I will cover a little bit the biofuel production side and then the balances. So how these uh, come together. So there's the structure of, of the presentation. Um, so at the, at the top level, we calculate kind of biofuel demand, uh, which basically is based on the share of, of biofuels in the total, total fuels used for using the transportation sector. So I'm talking about here biofuels versus fossil fuels. So if we talk about ethanol, that would be bioethanol versus uh, gasoline. And if we're talking about biodiesel, it, it would be biodiesel and um, fossil diesel production I mean, or, or use. So that's, uh, that's the share that I'm talking about. So it's basically the biofuel share in the total, um, total fuel share for transportation. And you can see that we have a, we have a function invented in the model, which basically sets the share according to the relative prices. Okay, so if the, the price of biofuels is relatively higher compared to the fossil fuels, then it will get a higher share and vice versa. Yeah, mathematically, we are using a Sigweight function. And then, I mean, it was mentioned several times, I think in the last couple of days in this training session, but just a, remind, just a reminder, so what a Sigweight function is. Uh, so this is basically a kind of smooth approximation of this of this kind um, change between a, a between you know this lower part and this upper part here. So that's the, the mathematical idea. There are many different fu functional forms in the in this small box. You can find many different implementations for this kind of sigmoid function. Uh, what we use in Capri. Is, is a built-in sigmoid function which is available in GAMS. Yeah, so what you will see in Capri is something like uh, in the GAMS code is something like sigmoid brackets, and then you you can uh, provide the parameters. That's the built-in sigmoid function of GAMS. Yeah. Uh, the important parameters we have, of course, we have a slope term, and we and we have two asymptotes that defines how wide. Uh, the function should be. And uh, you know how it looks like in the GAMS code. So as I said before, in the GAMS code, you will see something like sigmoid and brackets, and then you can provide all the parameters. Um, this is the device fill share function that I, I showed before. Um, as usual, this is defined, this, this is defined in a very general manner. So the same function, the same equation is true for biodiesel and bioethanol. It depends on this set X field, which we are talking about. We have a mandate parameter here, which basically defi defines how high this um, function is shifted. 
and we have all the different parameters of the sigma function here, you know, which uh, which calibrates this this function. If I if I go back a little bit to the previous slide, so this uh, this green mandate parameter. So if we increase the mandate, which we are doing the exercise, then we basically shift upwards to the function, so that we have a higher um, higher share of y fuels in the total demand. This is what we would like to achieve in the exercise later on. And all the different parameters are calculated so that we reach uh, this calibration point here, which is defined by the by the baseline with this red line. So basically we calibrate the, the sigma function to this point, assuming a man by the green line. So that's the, that's the idea behind it. Okay, I stop here for a moment for, for any clarification questions because then I uh, change to the bifur production sign. Um, Sorry. Yes, yes. Cora. Um, um, maybe I missed it a bit, but I'm still not quite sure what you mean by mandates. Okay, uh, so it's basically blending share. So basically how much biofuel should be blended Oh yeah. Uh, okay. okay. It's the political, yeah. That's the yeah. E ten or E five, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's the technical. I mean, there is a limit of how much ethanol can be blended in the in the fuels, so that the cars can use it. But what I'm talking about are the political targets, so that in each country, a given percentage of the of the fuels should come from biofuels, from sustainable sources. And another part is, of course, from fossil fuels. All right, thank you. Okay, so let's, let's go to the production part. Okay, uh, so this, this is the, well, a quite similar function what we have seen before, but it's kind of reversed. So basically, uh, what defines the biofuel supply in, in the example in France, uh, the production is how the, uh, the biofuel price relates to the average cost of producers. Yeah? And as higher this biofuel price compared to the costs, then it will be more profitable. So what we expect is that as we go to the, to the right-hand side of uh, to the right hand side, then the function, the value of the function will increase. And um, yeah, let's go to the GEMS code, how it is implemented. This function is a, is a little bit more complex than a simple sigma function, but the idea is the same. It has, it, but it is what, something which is called synthetic function because it has different parts. So we have a linear part, we have a semi local part and the sigma this function let's go to them together okay uh, so this is the the very simple linear oops, very simple linear part so what you can see here is the uh, p underscore by sup, sup parameter scale times something y something which is called v underscore biofuel price relative so that's the relative price of biofuels relative to the to the cost of production yeah this is the variable that drives the function so that's the linear part so it's a simple linear term and then we have a uh, semilog semi part here, um, which is the exponential of, of something, um, which is an alpha parameter time plus beta times the log of this variable. So this is why it's called semilog. And then we have the sigma part. So why we have this uh, complication? I mean, because at very different relative prices, this function behaves differently. So it, if the price is, is relatively small, if the value of the variable is relatively small, then the linear, linear part still defines um, some reasonable increase. Um, the sigma part is used in, in the normal ranges, basically. So if the, if the relative price is close to what we observed in the, in the baseline, but in very wild uh, cases, so when we increase the mandate to a lot, for example, then uh, the semi log part will also kick in and it will uh, help to, to smooth out the function so that we achieve this kind of uh, nicely smooth 
functional behavior. And why do we need a smooth functional behavior? Because of numerical reasons, because otherwise the function would blow up and numerically it would be very difficult to solve the optimization. Yeah, so that's basically behind. Let's go a bit more into the composition of the, of the biofuel production. So as was basically explained already in the, one of the first slides, so the total production of, uh, of biofuel is, is the sum of the first, first generation, second generation, and non-agricultural production. And how it looks like in the code is a simple equation, but what you can see here below. So we have the V production of biofuel, that's the first generation biofuel basically. And then we have the non-agricultural second generation. And if you see something like exogenous, that's, that's only, um, it's usually zero, but it's only a trick that we use uh, in simulations to increase um, either one of the exogenous assumptions uh, on how second generation production will, will continue. So this is only a technical term, but not directly related to the concept of the biofuel module. Yeah. And as I said before, only the first generations, only the variable, which you can see here is the underscore production by field is directly linked to the cropping activities. Yeah. Um, of course, the the feedstock mix, so basically the mix of the raw materials that we're using for biofuel production um, and change in the model, so it's endogenously determined. Um, again, it depends on the relative processing margins. So the more profitable to use um, one specific feedstock for biofuel production, the higher share it will be in the optimal mix. That's the idea. So it's a typical um, cost minimization versus profit maximization approach that we have in the models. Um, technically, we are using uh, CS shear equation. The mathematical form is here. And as we have seen yesterday, this can be almost directly translated into the GAMS code. Yeah? So we have something like, um, this is the CS shear parameter here. And then we have the relative prices in these brackets. And what you can see here is a kind of, it's similar to the substitution analysis, it is what we have seen before. And those are the um, elasticity parameters of this function. Let's go to the, so the average cost index. So what, so for, in order to the system to work in the optimization, we have to calculate an average cost index because if we go to the previous slides, um, this is the, I mean, this is the part because uh, we will compare uh, the cost of each individual feed item to the average. Yeah? So we have to calculate the average so that we can have uh, the relative cost. How we calculate this average? Again, we are using this kind of function, very much familiar for those of you who ever worked with a computer world, general equilibrium model. So this is the typical CS structure. Um, we have this uh, price index equation here. What is probably more interesting for us is to see what kind of biofuel feedstock we are considering in the model. And that's why I, I put here this screenshot and you can see that um, you are getting more and more familiar with the Capri codes, but I, I, I can, I try to decode what is meant here. So bio A is the bioethanol, bio D is the biodiesel, and all of them are linked so the first, gen first generation production of them is linked to some of the uh, commodities in the model. So for example, bioethanol is from soft wheat, rye, barley, all the different pistols that we have already presented in one of the first slides. And the same for biodiesel, those are linked to the to different oils. So the oils produced from the rubber seeds, um, including also oils that are not produced in the EU, but can be imported like palm oil. So that's the basic concept. Um, then, of course, we need to set up a balance. So basically, that the sum of all the fees of processing should be equal to the biofuel production, to the first generation biofuel production. Um, and this is this is the equation how it looks like in the games. If you want to have a closer look later on, but as usual in Capri, we are using a kind of uh, mapping uh, set here. 
So basically, we map all the biofuel feedstocks to the different fuels. So for example, we map soft wheat to bioethanol. And we simply add up the, the processing multiplied with the processing coefficient. Yeah? And this will be um, the feedstock need that we have to uh, provide to the biofuel processing industry. Um, let me finish with this and then I open the floor for questions. So how the total demand will look like. Um, so the total use in the country, I mean, this is the, this is the general equation, which is not only used for, for biofuels, but, but for all the commodities. And this is something which we call Armington balance. So the total use in the country is the sum of the consumption, human consumption, which means by fuel cases should be zero. Uh, we have feed use, this is also zero, and we have processing and by fuel processing separated, yeah? Because, um, because basically we have a different structure for the biofuel bio industry than for, for example, for the oil industry, which produces uh, the oils and the cakes from the oil seeds. So those have different functional forms and that's why you separate them into different variables. So we have a processing quantity, which is a bit different from what we use for bioethanol or biodiesel production processing, which is a different variable for processing. Yeah? That's the highlighted line that you have here. Okay. And I guess there are many clarification questions. So I just wait for a few seconds and I collect some questions here at this point. Well, Aldo, you have probably a question. Is it, is it no, clear? No, it's not clear, but I don't have a question. <laughs> I'm sorry okay. to say that. <laughs> No, it's even, it, it's it, even I'm sorry, just maybe a comment. For me, at least. This is way too complex. I, I, I cannot follow. Same okay. here. I think it will be more easy. It will be easier to follow the example. So I propose that we go to the example. And Good. You know, I just put the graphical user interface there. And if you see the numbers, then it will be probably easier to understand. You can always ask me or interrupt me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so those are the hands and exercises that you can also download from the from the training website and I, I hope you did it already. Um, so let's let's do it without without a question. Yeah, let's just talk about the concept. So what we will do here. So basically we, we try to increase the mandate. What what actually means that we will increase the, the share of biofuels in the total fuel production, total fuel demand. Yeah? So we try to simulate a world where we expect the, that more and more biofuels will be, will be produced. Yeah? And th those should shift uh, or those squeeze out some of the fossil fuel used in the countries. Uh, the technical, technical way to do it for us is to shift the demand function upwards yeah and this is what is is meant here so basically we shift that green line upwards i mean for example from here from the six percent mandate share we try to do uh, shift over to the eight percent mandate share and this will generate uh, an additional demand in the model yeah. uh, the technical way to do it will be to increase this parameter which i put here so the data parameter and something related to QUTS, so that refers to quotas. That's the other name of mandates. And yeah? sometimes it's called by field quotas. Um, you, can, you can open the GANS files because those are already also provided. And uh, we can have a look at 
the, the content of the file together. So um, typically you have to uh, copy or put those files in under GAMS and the scenario folder and biofuels, yeah? Because we are talking about biofuel policies. Um, and if you open it, it looks like this. So basically the important part here is that we set a mandate shock, a multiplier. In this case, we, the multiplier is two, so we, we double the mandate. So if it was 5% before, it will be 10%. That's so simple. And then we define this mandate shock for the different bio, biofuels. So either for bioethanol or biodiesel and for all the countries. In this case, uh, we implemented the shock for all the countries in the EU27. Yeah? And then the new mandate is calculated as the old mandate multiplied by this multiplier. Yeah, So we take the old mandate and, and double it. But it's just a quick, very quick question. Yes. Yeah. When you have there U27 year 19, does that mean that the shock starts on the year 19, uh, 2019? No, it, uh, yeah, it, it is interesting because uh, we had EU27 before uh, Croatia joined the EU, which was called EU27. Yeah, uh, and okay. then <laughs> when the UK left with the Brexit, so we had to find another code, code name. And this is often the most difficult part of programming to find a good code name. Uh, and we invented this one. The year 19 means that after 2019, we expect that UK will not be part of the EU. Um, and that's fine. So that's the U27 Brexit. That's the current, that's the current U27. So all okay. the countries without the EU. Cool. Cheers. Okay, I mean, I, I'm sure you, you did in the previous days that you used the scenario editor. So if you, uh, the correct way of, of putting this together is that you, you first need the really, Need the baseline scenario. So basically you need the, the basic policies that you have in the baseline. And on top of it, we implement this mandate increase. Yeah. So those are the two lines we have here. Um, and this is the scenario editor that we used before. Um, maybe we can do it together. It depends on how much time we have. Alex, do we have time for going through this together? Uh, actually, this this scenario editor was not used this time as they oh, had to okay. some, but but, that, but they are better. they are well known uh, how to put uh, a scenario in a GEMS file and put that in the in the right place in GEMS poll input user send. So and uh, given that it's only one line change, is you can skip that part. I think, uh, but it's good okay, that so I mean you we'll also simply skip that. Yeah. Yeah. So then we can also go directly to this part. Yes. Yeah, okay, so the idea is that, uh, na, na, na. okay, so we simply, then we load in the results yeah, and we will analyze it together. So usual way, you go to this uh, run scenario work step, run scenario only with the market model task, and then you can explore the results, yeah? So you have to select the baseline, which is called like this, and we have the double mandate scenario, which is called like this. And then we can analyze the results. Okay, let me let me open the GUI and then I can share the share my screen again. Uh, Mihaly, should should yes. we organize it then in that that they're in these three different groups shortly try to answer the questions you had in your presentation? Or how should we organize it? Yeah, we can do it like this because in the presentation we have we have some specific questions. Yeah, which are very basic questions. So basically, you have to load in the in the results. And uh, so they are from the wiki again available. Um, so we should do that in this way. Yeah. So maybe you have ten min minutes time to. Um, I relieve you uh, into the different groups now, and then you have 10 minutes time to try to answer, given the pre-cooked uh, result files you have provided at the wiki. And then we will mm -hmm. come back, yeah? And then probably you show uh, the results, yeah? Is it okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Good. And uh, maybe, Mihaly, you and uh, also David or Jordan, we help the group in case they need one.
biodiesel feedstock. Um, and it, the, the biodiesel feedstock use increased the most in relative terms for palm oil, and it increased by 246.02, um, I think that was percent, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the, it increased the least for rape oil only by 27.69%. And um, well, we didn't get to really actually talk about the possible impact on trade feedstock, but um, I think it, or we think it um, would mean that the EU would import more palm oil, which probably in the end would have actually a negative effect on the environment. Yeah. So, so uh, the second group, Felix, uh, have you looked at this trade? Uh, we didn't look at the trade in detail, um, but there is a larger import of uh, palm oil. Uh, and the last question was about the uh, sustainability issues and uh, palm oil is well known for uh, deforestation uh, and loss of biodiversity um, if it gets uh, yeah, found. Okay. Okay, I'm, I, I mean, actually, I feel like Felix Weigand, but uh, it's okay. Uh, probably you also found that. Um, good. Um, May I ask a, a, quick, a quick question? Please. Yeah, wasn't the mandate in the beginning of this uh, biofuel program set or was supposed to be set at 25%, if I remember correctly? Do, do you remember something like that? You mean from the regular? I mean the targets. Yeah, from the regulators. Today is five, right? Wasn't it supposed to grow until twenty-five percent, and then they realize, oh my God, this is. I mean, we are bringing so many uh, biofuel from palm oil, and therefore it's hurting the uh, environment there. So we stopped this. We set it at ten maximum. Wasn't it like that? Yeah, maybe the the point is is I mean you have a good point here. So if we if you look at the discussion like 15, 20 years ago when biofuel started to you know kick in and increasing, yeah, they they were meant as as a, as a tool for in, increasing sustainable renewable energies, but then they realized it will not it will not happen at least at least not in the first generation biofuel production. So the discussion now is more on how to improve the second generation. So what is the technical progress that we have to make in order to make biofuel production sustainable? Uh, and yes, I mean, I think the, the current number is some, something like 7%, which is expected for first generation biofuels uh, in the midterm, uh, but it will probably be, be below the 10% that you mentioned. Thanks, um, yes. And uh, they are needed to be certificated now. I mean, it's, um, this was also a long process, yeah? So it was not clear what kind of uh, feedstocks actually contributed, or if you have just put mineral fertilizer. So then we had here in Germany a long discussion how to certif certif certificate, so to say, feedstocks and how this is uh, are then used to trans uh, transfer it in a, a more sustainable um, biofuel production. Um, uh, a long discussion, and I think we learned a lot uh, in this policy debate because it was also this tank teller this discussion. Yeah, it's it's also uh, not only the sustainability but also food security plays an important role, and uh, entfaltungsfreie Lieferketten. So I, I cannot remember what was the English name for that. Yeah, so so that you are not, uh, of course, uh, importing palm palm oil from somewhere from Singapore or uh, from. Where is it mainly coming from? Probably, and then uh, destroying Malaysia, uh, Malaysia, yeah. Malaysia uh, destroying a lot of forest at the same time. So thanks a lot.